Lee Child is the author of the brilliant Jack Reacher novels. Not only do they fill my own bookshelves, but they probably fill yours as well. They've sold over 100 million copies worldwide, which is an incredible number. And now the big news is Reacher comes to Amazon Prime. I'm already set up with a subscription, ready to watch it. So many of you know the story of Jack Reacher, but do you know the story of the man behind the man? Well, it's time to meet him. It's a pleasure to welcome to the High Performance Podcast, Lee Child. Lee, hello. Hey guys, really good to be with you. Yeah, thank you. Mike. This might be slightly different to um, some of your other interviews today, Lee, but this podcast exists to delve into the, the minds on and the learnings of some of the world's highest achievers. So in your opinion, what represents high performance? Well, I guess that's dependent on, uh, on what field you go into. You know, if you want to become a motor racer, then sure, you want to win the races and become world champion or whatever. And uh, I went into being a writer and the structure is somewhat imposed upon you in that sales are measured and there are bestseller lists and so on, uh, which I always feel kind of weird about, you know, because... Writing and reading is not the Olympic Games, should there really be a ranking of that nature, but there is. And given that there is, then obviously my instinct is if you're in it, you better win it. And so I particularly, I love being number one in the bestseller list. It's just a thing that uh, nobody can take away from you. You know, you've done it. That is, that is the success that you get. And um, it feels really great. Well, I was going to ask you, Lee, if I can take you back to the start of your writing journey then, because I'm intrigued by that job you'd had at Granada for 18 years when you were made redundant and you spoke about how fear and hunger was a motivation for you to begin writing. Can you tell us about what your thought process was of dealing with this trauma and what you learned from it that you still use today to write? Yeah, it was a, I mean, it was in one way a super stressful period because I was 39 uh, about to become 40, and that is like a classically bad age to be out of work. Um, you know, tragically, it's too young to retire completely because you're not quite there yet, and so you got to find something else to do. But nobody wants to hire you when you're 40 and you're sort of too old and too kind of tired by that point to go through that interviewing process that you used to do when you were 20. Um, so it was a it was a really miserable prospect, really, and and scary. And that you know, I was like everybody else. I had a mortgage, and I had a kid in school, and I had uh, credit cards and stuff like that. Uh, so, in practical terms, it's a problem. But simultaneously, I also felt that it was also kind of the last chance. It was your last opportunity to change or do something different. Um, it's halfway through your working life, more or less, and you've gained a lot of discipline. You've, you've learned a lot of things. You're a different person by then. You're not the idiot you were when you were 20. You can look back over the first half of your career and say, what have I got? What have I learned? How do I use this going forward? So in one way, it seemed like a really shining opportunity. And I, I played a psychological trick on myself, which was to completely ignore the negatives and just concentrate on the positives, which was, yeah, I can start over. I can do something different. I can be somebody new. And um, again, I played another trick, which was I, had, I, I allowed no doubts at all. I thought, I'm going to write a book. It's going to be successful. It's going to be okay which is a ludicrous, delusional thing to do because writing a book is like buying a lottery ticket, probably even worse odds than that, to be honest. And so, but if you allow that doubt to creep in, you're never going to get anywhere. So I, I remember thinking, yeah, people would ask me, what are you going to do now? And I said, I'm writing a book. And in my own mind, like night follows day, it was going to be a success. And people would look at me like with this rather apprehensive, worried expression, like he's also gone crazy. <laughs> I love that story. So where did this growth mindset come from then, Lee? Because to, to take the leap is one thing. To take the leap and to be smart enough and educated enough to know that if you control your mind, then more often than not, you can control the outcome. Where did this come from? Yeah, no, deep down, I think it came from Birmingham, which was where I grew up. Um, and for those people that that don't know Birmingham or don't remember it at that time, it was a manufacturing city where 
uh, they could do anything at all. Whatever you wanted, somebody would make it for you. You could, you could historically, in the 19th century, a long time ago now, 200 years ago, really, it was the Silicon Valley of the world. Um, anything could be done there. And that, uh, and it was really the last of the industrial cities to fade away. So when I was a little kid, it was still going full strength. And it was all based on the fact that whatever you wanted, somebody could do it for you. They would do it well. They would do it with a little bit of understated pride. And then tomorrow they would tell you how to do it better, faster and cheaper. So it was an artisan approach and it was totally baked into me that I believed in my, deep down that if you did the work and you, you got it right, then somebody would buy it. It was that simple because that's what I saw all around me. And, and not in a sort of pretentious, highfalutin way. It was all down and dirty, you know, whatever you wanted. You want a bolt, you want a nut, you want a steering wheel. When I was a little kid, for instance, the, the Ford Cortina came out, which was not made in Birmingham, actually. It was made down in Dagenham. But Birmingham was a car town, and so the gossip was always about cars. And there was this story going around in about 1961 and 1962 that somebody had redesigned the steering wheel for the new Cortina like 20 times in order to save a penny on making it. And a lot of people sort of thought, well, that's stupid. But if you were a, a Brummie, you understood immediately. A million steering wheels is a million pennies, and that's, a, that's, a worth save, that's worth saving. And it also got past the argument, what is art and what is commerce? They're both basically the same thing. You, you can't disentangle one from the other. So that was my background. And so I thought, if I do the work, I do it properly, uh, it's got to work out. I think one of your great talents, Lee, is the fact that you seem so open to experiences. I, I've read the quote from you that you said that um, writing was a second career for you, you know, having pursued law at university, where you said you were open to learning about clarity of expression. And then the work in the theatres was about the show must go on. How have you remained so open to the different experiences and, and, and kept that curiosity alive? I think if you are open to uh, to things, you can never close off. You know, it's how you start. Um, because, you know, in a weird way, life is about teaching you that you don't know much, uh, but you've got to be open to that possibility. Um, for instance, you know, I'm doing a lot of interviews because uh, Reacher has got, come into Amazon Prime streaming television. And before I was a writer, as you said, I worked in television. Um, but you've got to know what you don't know. And to quote Clint Eastwood, a man has got to be aware of his limitations. And my limitation, obviously, is I left television 25 years ago. So and that is like five or 10 generations of television since then. Um, when I left in uh, or was kicked out in 1995, the internet had barely been invented. You know, nobody knew anything about it. And the idea of streaming television was way in the future. So if you're open to the fact that you need to learn, you're simultaneously open to the fact that you don't know everything yet. And I'm quite happy to say I, I, there is a quality to streaming television that I don't understand. You know, it was not around for me. And so I need to learn it. Um, and I can't imagine living any other way. I mean, whoever, at, at what age do you know enough? You just don't. I'm really interested to talk to you about process versus outcome, Lee. Like, do you look at the, the new series of Reacher and think, I want that to be the most streamed program on Amazon? Do you look at the, the, your book that just came out here recently in the UK and you want that to sell a certain number of copies? Or have you understood the power of just the process, writing the best book you can, creating the best TV series you can? Well, one follows the other, that um, you've got to do the best job you can. I mean, in terms of books, absolutely, yeah. I, I remember a very early uh, thought that I had when I was writing the first book, and I had an idea, I can't remember what it was, for a, a move or a scene or a line of dialogue even, and I thought, you know what? I could save that for the for the second book. 
And then I thought, wait a minute now, if you don't give 100% to the first book, there will not be a second book. And so that was very seminal for me, that you've got to live in the moment. You've got to give it 110% that day. And I always took that approach that every book I wrote, I, I figured it, I made myself think of it as the first and the last book I would ever write. Um, there was a very famous baseball player in America, Joe DiMaggio, and uh, pe people asked him, you know, why, why do you play so hard every day? And he said, because, you know, there could be some kid who's never seen me before and therefore uh, I've got to be the best I can be every single day. And that is the only way to do it. Um, storing things up for the future sounds like a great idea, but in the arts or anything creative, it's a very bad idea. You, if you've thought of it, then use it today. And one of Jack Reacher's mottos that I've read you attributed to yourself again, Lee, is that he hopes for the best and plans for the worst. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the pros and cons of that approach? Yeah, I mean, I think it's obviously uh, inspiring and personally important to, to hope for the best. Uh, you've got to... You've got to have a positive outcome in mind. Otherwise, what's the point of doing anything? Um, if you're undertaking something, then, yeah, aim for a, a good target. But you've got to be aware that you might not reach it. And if you don't, then you've got to have a plan B. And you you can't be caught out with uh, being unprepared. And um, I didn't really do that as a young person you know, it was, I imagined life to be very linear. You know, you would, you start somewhere and you'd go up and up and up and then you'd finish somewhere else and you get a gold watch and then you'd be um, retired. And then pretty soon you realize life is actually not linear. It's maybe two steps forward, one step back or one sideways or whatever. And so if you were uh, unprepared, that is, you're letting yourself down. So yeah, you got to. You hope for the upside, but you got to be aware of the downside and know how you're going to deal with it should it show up. And we have a lot of people listening to this who are teachers. We have a lot of business leaders, um, employees, and employers. What are the what are the processes that you go through when you're writing or when you're creating anything to make sure that you are operating at the absolute top of your window? Uh, well, first, a big shout out to teachers because, um, you know, that is so key and so critical. And I'm sure you guys can quantify it, but I bet every person who's got somewhere has at least one teacher in their past that has somehow inspired them or so on. I certainly did one particular, I mean, half a dozen in, in tiny little details, but one particular teacher that kind of forms you. My daughter had exactly the same experience, one particular teacher that completely inspired her and shifted the course of her life. So teachers are very important, very un undervalued. And what you got to do after that is realize that you learned something, that your life was altered and, and was shifted in terms of course, and then keep yourself open to that possibility. It might happen again. And if at all possible, pass that on to somebody else. It's like a two-way obligation. Keep your mind open to the fact that there may be another teacher that 20 years later will change your life again, or it is, in fact, your obligation to help other people if possible. Um, and everybody can. Everybody can help somebody else. Pay it forward. That's what I, I think is one of the biggest obligations in life. So would you tell us about the intervention that that teacher made on your life that you described? Well, it was, uh, it was, I was at high school and he was the, uh, he was an English teacher, but it was nothing to do with English. It was to do with the drama. He ran this drama club, uh, like after hours and super professional in the sense of, you know, you're a teenager, you're 16, 17 years old or something. And it's, it's all about you. And he was like, no, it is not all about you. It is about the audience, first, second, and third. And that was life-changing to me. It, you're serving somebody else. You are, especially in this kind of business, 
You know, so many writers are all about themselves. They buy the leather jacket and the black polo neck and this a pack of Gaulois and so on, and they think this is being a writer. And it's not about you. It's Is the reader happy? Is the reader turning the pages? Are they desperate for the next book? That's the only measure of success. So it, it's an odd thing. It's a juggling act because being a writer is, a, is monstrously egotistical. I mean, you're sitting there saying, I'm writing something that – that is worth other people's times reading, you know, which is a ludicrously egotistical thing to say, but you have to believe it uh, because you, you're serving the reader. But once you then have achieved that, you've got to remember it's about the reader. It's not about you. It's not about, uh, you know, getting in the gossip pages or being famous or anything like that. It's keeping the reader happy, which boils comes back to the Birmingham thing, doing your job, do it right. I think it's brilliant. Was that also driven home to you when you worked in the theatres, when you were kind of operating in the shadows, really learning about the fact that it's the audience first, it's the colleague second, whatever happens, you know, the, the show must go on. Yeah, the show must go on. Absolutely. that That is about respecting the audience. But along with that in the theatre is this truly joyful, hypnotic thing of putting on a show. I'm a total sucker for that. The, the idea of getting together and, and putting on a show. Um, which is a, a separate, unique joy, really, with the theatre, because you're doing it live. You're doing it there and then. Um, what you do is instantly reacted to by the audience. Television is uh, typically, you know, there's reviews of the previous night's TV in the paper. So it, that's like 12 hours delayed. Uh, if you're doing a book, it's it's possibly a year delayed by the time the book comes out. And by the time the mass market has read it in paperback, it could be two years. Um, so the, the theatre is magical from that point of view, that it is instantaneous. You can, the hush of an audience, the indrawn breath happening in real time is, is a fabulous thing. And it's therefore quite a quick introduction to what works and what doesn't. Um, and doing things in collaboration with other people and the communication with the live audience uh, was a wonderful, wonderful thing. I love that. As a consumer of theatre too, I mean, I've seen some shows that are hysterically funny and there is no sensation on earth like being one of a thousand people literally helpless with laughter. You know, that's just a wonderful feeling. A bit like why I like going to the football. Um, you know, I like football as a sport. I like it as a, you know, to observe the technique and the athleticism and all that kind of stuff. But what I really love about football is the madness of the crowd. Um, when you score, especially in a tight match or an important game when you score that hysteria in the crowd 50,000 people simultaneously hysterical with joy is one of those uh, one of those feelings that's probably never existed before because in in most of our evolutionary history did we ever have 50,000 people experiencing the same thing at the same time probably not uh, so it's a, it's almost a new discovery that is addictive um, my problem is I'm a Villa fan, so those euphoric moments are few and far between, yeah. Try being a Norwich supporter. <laughs> <laughs> so the benefit of that feedback loop that you described, Lee, that the theatre offers you that immediate feedback to whether a line lands well or a play is going down well, who provides you with the feedback loop when you're writing to say, this is of the usual high standard of your previous writing? Well, the you have to do it yourself, obviously, because it's a completely solo job. Um, you know, to, to be to be technical about it, obviously, there are publishers and there are editors and there are booksellers and all that kind of stuff. So there is ultimately a team involved at some point. But while you're actually creating it, it's the loneliest job in the world. And so you've got to have there are two halves to your brain by this point. One is the writer half and one is the reader half. And. You don't become a writer unless you've previously been a passionate reader and an extensive reader. And you've got to learn to let one half of your brain comment on the other half. Um, in, one, in, in a lot of ways, it directs it. If you're not, you, I never write with a plan. I never have a plan or an outline. Every, right. every next line is an invention that is based, I, I came to realize, based on me as a reader kind of, telling the writer half of me what what you need to do now it's like having this voice on your shoulder saying yeah we need a cliffhanger here we need this we need that right. and so the feedback comes from yourself 
but it's a kind of different version of yourself. And after all this success, after all these book sales, after this incredible journey and remarkable story, what is it that drives you now? Um, it, it, it's a kind of contract that uh, that changes over the over the years because when you start out, you're it's a sort of financial thing. You're trying to make a living. It's so therefore it's a financial contract. Then when you do become successful, it's purely an emotional contract with the reader. The reader gives you something. And I'm not particularly talking about the money because books are so cheap, you know, that if, if a reader reads a book and doesn't like it, it's not the money that I worry about. It, it's their time. They're giving you two or three days of their life uh, that they can never get back. And uh, that is a huge responsibility. So it's an emotional contract not to let the reader down. That's what really motivates me now. Lovely. So just to conclude then, Lee, we normally finish our uh, podcast interviews with a series of quick fire questions. So if you'll permit us to do that, the first one is, what are the three non-negotiable behaviors that you and the people around you have to buy into? Uh, the three, um, I think number one is uh, get over yourself. In other words, um, understand that you are, if there's three people there, you're a third of the equation. It's not you and two extras. You are an equal part. Um, number two would be, therefore, treat people with the same respect that you would like to be treated yourself which does not mean necessarily exaggerated courtesy or deference or anything like that. But if you like people being pleasant to you, then it's your obligation to be pleasant to other people. And I can't think of a third. I mean, I think those two really just about cover it. Are they good enough? They can, they can, uh, they can cover for the third. Lee, if you could go back to one period in your life, where would you go and why? Um, that's... Uh, it depends what I could do. Could I correct the mistakes? Could I do something? If you'd want better? to. I probably I probably wouldn't want to correct the mistakes because then that gets you into an endless kind of loop of uh, where do you stop with that? Um, I would like to go back to about 1969, I think. I was, um, you know, about 14, 15 years old and... If I have one regret in life, it's that I didn't pay enough attention. You know, those were magical years with a lot of great things happening. Music, uh, politics, society, sex, drugs and rock and roll. You know, it was and I had plenty of that. But I sort of I do remember thinking, oh, I can catch up on that next year or something. And you never do. So in my generalized regret is I didn't pay enough attention. So I would pick a great year like 69 and go back and just live every minute of every day fully open and fully aware to it. What's been the biggest sacrifice you've made to, uh, in your journey to success? Um, the biggest sacrifice is, is purely just juggling time. You know, it's, uh, it's, you have to give up doing certain things. Uh, when I worked in television, you know, long, irregular hours. And uh, so I missed a lot of my daughter's life uh, because it was shift work. I saw a lot of it that other guys didn't see who worked nine to five. But overall, um, yeah, it's the sacrifice of time that um, and you look back again and you think, yeah, well, you know, next week I can catch up or whatever. But you never do. Those days are gone. So the sacrifice you make is uh, if you do A, you're not doing B. How important is legacy to you? Really not important at all. I mean, I think that is such a, a kind of highfalutin thing. Like I said, I'm a Brummie. And uh, if, you know, if you uh, start talking about your legacy in Birmingham, they're going to look at you really peculiar. <laughs> so I think that's the joy of life, actually. It doesn't matter, you know. If people are enjoying what I wanted, what I'm doing now, that's fantastic. But I, I think it would be absurd and bizarre if somebody was – studying me in college 100 years from now. I mean, that would just be ridiculous. Not going to happen. So I'm completely indifferent to legacy. I would like to be remembered for a few days as a nice guy who did his best. And uh, a week later, I don't care if everybody forgets about me. 
And what advice would you give to a teenage Lee just starting out on your journey? I would say don't panic. Uh, you know, you're looking at a guy who eventually hit his stride at the age of 40. So I think it's, there's a lot of pressure on teenagers, especially our system somehow demands that they narrow down their choices, they narrow down their studies, and they've got to develop a target. And you've got to realize you're going to be stuck in that track for 50 years possibly. So uh, if you can't think of it, if you're not making a, a good start to it, do not worry. Something will happen sooner or later. And uh, I think we'd all be better off if it, actually we didn't have to do that you know just maybe if you want to be something do something else completely different deliberately just to broaden up your experience a little bit fantastic and the final question lee what would be your one golden rule your one final message to people that tune into this podcast for them to live a high performance life the golden rule is uh it ain't a dress rehearsal you gotta this is the only life you get and um so just get on with it. I've got two mottos. Do it, uh, do it once and do it right. Uh, that's the, probably the best bet. And, um, you know, you can fix some things later, but other things you can't fix. Um, pay attention and stop and smell the roses sometimes. You know, that's what a lot of people regret not doing. Uh, so if you can put all those three together or four together, don't panic if you can't decide what to do. Have fun, have fun day to day, uh, but take it seriously. You're not going to get a second chance. Lee, absolutely brilliant. A real insight Thank you. in the way that you've lived, the way you've operated, completely devoid of any ego. Um, but I think a great reminder and probably the biggest lesson for people is that nothing's fixed, nothing's permanent. You know, you lost your job at a time that was really difficult to you. And here we are all these years later, and it's possibly the greatest thing that ever happened. Huh? Sure is. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Appreciate Lee. your time. Please hit subscribe, hit the notification bell, give us a thumbs up, leave a review, but somehow get involved with the High Performance Podcast and become part of our growing community. Thanks for being part of the adventure.